unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Today we're going to take our reading from Jeremiah chapter 31 from the 31st verse. Jeremiah 31 from the 31st verse. And this is what he says. He says, Behold, the days are coming. This was a prophet speaking of the days to come. Which are the days now? Okay, I want you to note that the days that are prophesied of in Jeremiah 31 are actually the days now. Okay, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He says, Not a covenant according to that which I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, that particular covenant, God says that they broke, although I was their husband, the Bible says. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them, and on their hearts will I write it. And I will be their God, and they will be my people, and they will no more teach each other underline teach each other or each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying know the lord for they will all know me they'll recognize and understand and be acquainted with me from the least of them to the greatest says the lord for i will forgive their iniquity and he says and i will seriously remember their sins no more i love the word seriously god is serious about not remembering your sins he's serious it's not a joking issue. It's not a play issue. He's serious about not remembering their sins because of the covenant that they're entering. Now, today I want to talk about the new covenant. The new covenant. What makes it new? All right? What makes it new? When you say we are under the new covenant, what is the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant? What is the difference between the New Testament and the Old Testament? There are many believers who have not yet understood the difference. Oh yes, they have clues. They can tell you. The New Testament means this. The New Testament means that. The New Testament begins here. There are people who just have the basic sense of it. All right? And they simply receive the basic things, the things that touch our common salvation. All right? But God wants to elevate you to a higher life of living. He wants to give you a superior life than the life no more men live. All right? And it's just more entailed in this than just what we say, oh, the New Testament is when Jesus died and was rose again. That's true. Or that uh, the justification now is by faith and not of works. And that is true. And now we are, you know, objects of mercy and grace. And that is true. All of that is true in the New Testament. So it's okay to have an idea. And some don't even have an idea at all. But regardless of where you're at in this understanding, today I want to help you understand what makes this covenant new. For some, when you talk about the word new, some of them regard it or think or consider it as sort of a positioned element of time. Eh? As though this newness, the word new, for some, it's like a positioned element of time in the sense that in the particular time, there was something old and now in a certain time, there was something new. And if you're to think about it that way, well, if Jesus died 2,000 years ago, <laughs> that's old. If you're just positioning it in the element of time, and you say, oh, that was newer, right, than the old, okay, then some of us have lived thousands of years after the Christ came and was raised to glory. And so if something happened hundreds of years ago, it's old in the sense of it happened long ago. So it's not in the positioning of time, but rather it's in the fiber of its nature. God is talking about the fiber of its nature. In fact, the Hebrew word there, for new, I will make you a new covenant, is haudash, haudash. And haudash means one which makes itself new every time. One which has the ability of repairing itself constantly. One which presents newness every time. 
So it's not just new in your understanding of positioning that that came after the old, but it has the ability of refreshing every time, renewing every time. It is a renewal covenant in the sense of it has the power, okay, in its nature, in the fiber of its nature to create newness, to create freshness, to create restoration. Every time, it is a covenant that constantly renews and is new. It's constantly new. It's not positioned in your elements of time. No, it is a covenant that is constantly new. It is constantly working anew. It is constantly presenting freshness. It's constantly presenting newness. It is constantly repairing things. It is constantly restoring things. It is as fresh now as it was 2,000 years ago. It does not run old. It does not decay. It does not go backward. It doesn't. It is constantly renewed and renewed and renewed and renewed and it's anew and anew and anew and anew every time. That is the thing Isaiah as well sees. All right? Isaiah saw the same in 43 verses 18. He says, remember ye not the former things. Okay? He says, neither consider the things of old. He says, behold, I will do a new thing. I will do a new thing. I will do a kaudash. Okay? I will do some new. I'll create an experience that brings newness, that brings freshness, that creates restoration constantly. It's an ever-flowing experience of newness. It's an ever-flowing grace of freshness. It brings freshness in everything it touches. It brings renewal in everything that it comes in contact with. It has a way of rebuilding everything that breaks every time that thing breaks. That's what makes it the new. He says, Behold, I do a new thing. And he says, And it shall spring forth. He says, Shall ye not know it? He says, I'll even make a way in the wilderness. Okay, I'll make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. That's what this thing does. That's what this covenant does. It makes a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And he continues to say, and the beast of the field shall honor me because of this new thing. He says, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Okay, if it's a place that is deserted, all right, and then waters come, what's that doing? It's refreshing. It's refreshing. That means every dry and parched place receives life. It receives water. It's rejuvenated. Okay? It's ignited. It's set ablaze. It's given life. All right? There's no life in the desert. Nothing grows in the desert. You cannot plant crops in a deserted place, except if you have to manipulate the ground and the weather. But there's just no way you can plant anything. All right? And what does it mean when waters come, all right? What does it mean to refresh the patched places, to bring rivers in deserts? It's something that brings life because water is a representation of life and the word. And so when he says that the beasts shall honor me, the dragons and the all, he says, I'll give water into the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. He says, these people, he says, have I formed for myself and they shall show forth my praise. That means because of that new thing, it's inevitable. We have to show forth praise. The life of Christianity is not a life to be sorry because you're successful, to apologize for being great. No. You were called, the Bible says, to show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The light was marvelous. I am a subject of his glory. I'm a conduit of that glory. Everywhere I go, the glory of God is in my life. In everything that I touch, the glory of God is working through me. If it's a business, the glory of God is showed forth. If it's a career, the glory of God is showed forth. If it's a ministry, the glory of God is showed forth. In my life, in my marriage, in my teaching, you know, in my children, in every aspect of your life. And I hope as I'm saying these things, you're saying those things to yourself also. 
that the glory of God is everywhere around you. The glory of God is on your life. It's in your countenance. When people look at you, there's something about you. That's not normal. They will look at you and say, there's something about that man. There's something about that woman. Why? Because you were called to show forth the praises. All right? Why? Because there's something that makes you anew. All right? Moses needed to go days on the mountain to hide himself for his face to shine. Okay? He needed something to reignite him. And every time the glory was diminishing, the Bible says he would get a veil and cover himself. So people would not see the diminishing of the glory. Why? Because he needed to maintain a certain atmosphere, okay, of person before the people. At least they think, huh, this is some that can come and leave you. And some Christians leave a life. That's why I said some of you have not understood the covenant under which you're under. Some people leave a life where it's glorious today, tomorrow it's diminishing. Today it's working, tomorrow it's not working. Today things are upright and tomorrow things are not right. And I think, ah, you know, that's life. The life of who? The life of men or the life of the children of God? The Bible says the path of the just shines brighter and brighter and to a perfect day. The longer you live, the brighter you shine. That is the path of the just. So you choose. Do you want to associate with the way the people of this world live their lives? Or do you want to do life according to the word of God? It is possible to be better every day. In fact, God has called you to glory, to glory, to glory, into glory every day. You wake up. There are masses that are new every morning to take you to another level of glory than you were yesterday. So if you've been in the faith for five years, ten years, something on you should be able to show. It's showing on my life. It's showing on yours. Something on your life should be able to show that you have actually walked with God for some time. The people, when they start speaking, you can tell they are not just two weeks. They have really walked with God for some time. And some people don't actually know that there's a difference between experience, okay, in our walk with God for a time and revelation. Revelation is good. Revelation is not time bound, okay? Revelation doesn't need you to go to spend 20 years. No, if it hits you that moment, you're introduced into another level of the spirit, all right? But that does not mean that you ignore our experience in God, our experiences in God, all right? The time some people have spent under oil, some people have spent in the anointing, you know? Certain things are stored up ancient in our spirits. And of course, revelation is a window if you know how to utilize it, okay? Because many people use revelation only to the end of the door. It's more of what they are giving out to the people. It's not so much of how much they are being ministered unto. All right? And yet in the things that we preach, like the Bible says, for are you a teacher of men and not a teacher of yourself? Or oh, somewhere in Romans. He says, for you a teacher of men and not a teacher of yourself. He's saying that it's one thing to have, you know, a one-way treat of simply giving because the gift is stored in you to know how to articulate and to speak to men in the way you should speak to them. But it's another when you are being ministered to in the same things that you minister to men. That creates a certain stability of the spirit. It justifies you in the spirit for men to approve you as true. Sometimes men don't approve us as true because we're speaking truth. But men approve us as true because we carry the bearing that in our affirmation of the things that we are speaking to men. When I speak about healing, I have healed. If you have walked with me or seen me or watched me for three, four, five years, those people around me, they will tell you that I'm actually what I preach. I'm actually what I preach. When I speak faith, I live faith. All right? When I speak divine health, I live it. When I speak wealth, I live it. When I speak breakthrough, I live it. When I speak, you know, giving yourself to service, I serve. I serve God. When I speak to loving God, I love. When I speak of worship, I worship God. I leave the things that I preach. For those that know me and are in my circles, they know that I'm a believer. And there are many people who live that way. They are what they actually profess. But to worship God with your lips and your heart is far is the challenge of the Christian faith. We cannot have results, all right? We cannot have answers when what we are cannot be demonstrated. You understand what I'm saying? That doesn't mean that we're perfect beings. That doesn't mean that we are perfect, okay? But even the work in progress shows that we are men and women under conviction, and that's important. We're men and women under conviction. We aspire to be better every other day, okay? 
And so when we come back to what I was trying to express, that some people use revelation only as a door, all right? They are simply conduits that avail themselves for God to speak through them the words that he must speak. But of those things, they're not edified in the same. God has not just called you to be a conduit. He has called you to be a partaker of his divine nature. You see, when you say, for example, I'm just a vessel, right? We are a vessel in part, but we're not just vessels, okay? We're more than vessels. If you think you're a vessel, right? If, for example, if you're talking about a plastic cup, if you pour water there, that cup is a vessel, all right? But it's not a partaker of the water in it, all right? It carries no nature of the water. It's just plastic. It holds the water, you know, or the tea, the chill drink, all right? And then people say, we are vessels. But to what extent, all right? We are vessels that are partakers of the substance within us. That's different, okay? You're not just this, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, revelation in, revelation out. Certain users and then dumps. And then God comes and also puts his word through you. It works through you and then you go, no, 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 no. That's not the life of Christianity. The life of Christianity is not just you being that vessel that anyone is using or anybody is using. No, you are a partaker. Even when you are not yet born again in darkness, the Bible says, for when you lie and you not like your father the devil, you are children of the devil. When you were lying in your past life, your past nature, before you became born again, when you told a lie, the Bible says you were doing so because you are of your father, the devil, it is in the nature of the devil to lie, to speak a lie. It's in the nature of the devil to speak a lie. Like it is in the nature of God to speak truth. So we're not just vessels, no. But we are also partakers of the nature of the substance within these vessels. Yeah? That's why he says we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of power might be of God and not of ourselves. All right? That treasure is one with your spirit. You are one with God. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. He's one spirit with the Lord. They are one spirit. You are one with God. There's no separation. The dividing walls have been broken through the newness of this message. They've been broken. So when you apply this revelation, even as a window, okay, for your soul to minister to your spirit. It lightens you up. It lightens you up, okay? You're not just a minister of things passing through you, but you receive of the same things. When you speak things that you have experienced and you allow God to deal with you, okay, I've seen people who preach things they can't do. They can actually teach other men to do what they cannot do. Someone says, oh, don't gossip, but they're gossipers. Oh, don't lie. But then they tell lies. But they are good teachers. So they say, in quotes, do as I say, but don't do as I do. Uh-uh. We're supposed to teach men to do as we say and as we actually do. He says, when you do that, you make the Gentiles obedient both in word and deed. I will not speak of the things save which Christ has wrought by me, all right, or in me, that I might make the Gentiles obedient in word and deed. Obedient in word and deed. There's a grace that goes into people to do. It's easy for people to go on the streets when we say we're going on the streets to preach because I have stood on those streets to preach the gospel. Now, another pastor will think, oh, let's tell people to go on the streets and then he stays in his room eating burgers. It won't work because what you're trying to extend through your ministry is not in your seed. It's not in your substance. It's not in the fiber of your nature. All right? Every priest produces after their own kind. It's been easy for people in my ministry to heal the sick because they see me heal the sick. It's been easy for them to give because they've seen me giving. It's so easy for them to love because they've seen me love. It's easy for them to forgive because they've seen me forgive. You see, we only produce our kind. But some ministers think that you are going to sort of create this, you guys do all this and me, I be doing that. No. You only produce of your own kind. Every seed produces after its own kind. And so, get yourself to the working. Fold your hands to the brass and tacks and do what must be done. You will see that it will be easy. Some of you pastors, you quarrel with people. Oh, you're not submissive. You're very rebellious. But man of God, you're probably rebellious as well. You understand? If your people see you serve a man, they will serve men too. If your people don't see you honor and serve, 
You do unto others what you want to be done unto you. It's that simple. You reap what you sow. Be not deceived. Deception begins when we start to think that we can sow of seeds that are not in our spirit. That is deception. You understand? Back to what I'm sharing. God, in the forming of his people, his choice, his people that he has loved, he intended, as he spoke through Isaiah, that I'm going to do a new thing. It's the same idea that he speaks of in Jeremiah. He was more than just, oh, let's change the atmosphere in this dispensation. No, he was trying to bring a certain covenant. He was trying to establish us in a certain story, in a certain testimony. And this is what he's speaking. So when we come later in the New Testament, and Paul brings the same quote back in Hebrews 8, verses 10, and I want you to hear how Paul says it. He says, for this is the covenant He says that I will make with the house of Israel. Now he's quoting the same words of the prophet. After those days, saith the Lord. And he says, and I will put my laws into their mind, and I will write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And he says, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me. From the least to the greatest. Again, I insist on this. They shall not teach. That I mean that God is against the teaching. Anointing of the teaching. Grace is saying that there are things. Because of the new covenant. Because of the covenant you're in. They meet you in the place of knowledge. You know them because you're a new creation. Why? Because practically speaking. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He and you become one. So was this prayer in John 17, that we might become one day in me, or I in them. When you become born again, Christ dwells in you, all right? And when Christ dwells in you, remember the scriptures say that he was the word that became flesh and dwelled among men and we beheld his only glory as the only true son of God full of grace and truth. Now that word, the word Jesus coming in the inside of you, means that when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have received the word in you. And because you've received the word in you, there are things you know. You just know. For example, no born-again believer can sin and not know that it is sin. They know, you feel it. There was a time you'd make a mistake and not know that it's a mistake. The people in the world, it actually shocks me sometimes when I look at this, you know, contrast. When I look at this chasm, when I see this difference, it shocks me to the core when I see the things people in the world do, the laws people in the world pass, the rights people in the world are fighting for. It would shock you for a moment to say, okay, isn't it actually so obvious that this is the wrong order of things? Have people died to a place where they cannot sense anymore that is wrong for this to be this way? But it's just because they are dead to that life. But when you become born again, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, nobody tells you that you have lied or told a lie because the laws are written in your heart and in your mind. You know in fact, when a believer can do something and not feel remorse, all right? For we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our justification is simply free, but that doesn't take away the fact that you and I have, you know, messed up. You have messed up. People mess up. People mess up. But I'm saying, but is that thing, there's that person in you that tells you, mm -mm, here, no, that's not you. Okay? That doesn't need to be read. But David needed to be told that he has killed a man and taken his wife. Because he was a man of another covenant. But now these things are written anew. So there's a knowledge we have. When you walk out of love, you know it. When you do good, you know it. There are judgments that are built in your spirit because you carry the word of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right? But there's a place where the mind must be renewed in the reading of the word. All right? Because the mind needs a constant reminder of the things that are in your spirit. And I want you to mark that the things you read are already in your spirit. Paul says you are a written epistle known and read by us. And he says, and you are manifestly preached or ministered by us. You are ministered by us. You are ministered by us. So when we preach Christ, we're actually preaching you because you and Christ are one. He is in you and you are in him. All the things that are of Christ, if Christ is good, we're speaking about you in that goodness which is in Christ. When we speak of divine health, we're speaking of that health which is in Christ. That the communication of your faith might be effectual, Philemon 1.6, through the acknowledging of every good thing, 
okay, which is in you, which is in Christ. All right, which is in you, which is in Christ. In Christ. You see? So, when he says no man shall teach, it's because there are things you know. So as a preacher, I want to help you understand that as a minister or a preacher or a teacher right now speaking, I'm speaking the things that your spirit knows, but your mind is connecting to. All right? And if as a minister I can't do that, and I can't have a following, you will not tune in next Sunday. But there's a reason why you tune in constantly. It's because I'm speaking things that in your spirit you have a knowledge or an affirmation of, or some of them you might have not known them in your mind. But when I speak them, they sort of put a certain switch in your spirit. Say, hmm, that is it. You can approve them as true. Your conscience bears witness. Like Paul says, my conscience bears witness with the Holy Ghost. If you are of the Holy Spirit, when I speak truth, there are things that connect to you. They might be hard, they might be complicated, they might be even contrary to what your mind knows. But if you're born of God, there are things that invite you, there are things that you connect to. All right? So he says, no man will teach. But he says, 12, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and the sins and the iniquities I'll remember no more. Now, this is what I wanted to emphasize. Paul added, Hebrews 8, right? Verse 13, he added, in that he saith, a new covenant. In that he's saying that there's a covenant that renews and refreshes every time. He says, and he hath made the first old. All right? He has paused it. It has no power to renew. It has no power to refresh. It has no power to restore. It has no power to rebuild. That's why I feel sorry for people who are under the law. Because they're reading some that will never renew them. They're reading some that will never restore them. They're connecting to something that will never refresh them. So that means they'll wax, you know, hold. And he continues to say, Now, that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. What is that? The Old Testament. When he makes the old old, and he says, This one will no longer refresh, renew, rebuild, restore. He's saying, now listen to the rendering. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. That means the Old Testament, the old, is in a constant life of decay. It's in a constant life of oldness. He says, in that he says, when God speaks of a new covenant or an agreement, the Amplified says, he makes the old one obsolete, out of use. You cannot use it. You can't use the law to renew men. You cannot use the law in church to get rid of sin. You cannot use the law to heal the sick. You cannot use the law to rebuild ministries. You cannot use the law to restore because the letter killeth. And he says, and what is obsolete, he continues to say, out of use and annulled because of age, is ripe for disappearance and to be dispensed with altogether, to be dealt away with. That means, God deliberately, every other second, is clearing out the ministration of the law and strengthening and upholding and rebuilding the ministration of grace, the newness of the Spirit. You know what that means? Imagine if a pastor builds his ministry on the foundation of the law. <laughs> Imagine if a minister builds his church on the foundation of what God has regarded out of use, of what is obsolete, of what is waxing old, of what is decaying. That means he will see decay in his ministry. Many pastors are seeing stagnation in their churches. But not only in their churches, their members are stagnant. The marriages of their members are stagnant. The finances of their members are stagnant, even as they are stagnant. The health of their members is bad because they are submitting to what is decayed, what is waxing old. They cannot build ministry on that. You can't. Now imagine you bring that into your marriage and start to leave your marriage on laws. It will decay. It will get out of use. It will fail. You will fail. No wonder when it comes to divorcement in the New Testament, it could only be added under Moses, which is the law. The Bible says Jesus said that divorcement was allowed under Moses 
because of the hardness of your heart. It could not have been so with Christ. And that's why in scripture he adds and says, but that was not so from the beginning. It was not so from the beginning. It was never the mind of God from the beginning. So it even breaks me when I hear that in our day and age, people are debating whether man and woman are supposed to live together or not. Where people are debating whether divorce is wrong or... I'm not judging those that are divorced or divorcing. No, I don't know the state of your place. I cannot judge each person at the goal. There are reasons, all right? Even in scripture, you know, some of you could have your own reasons, and I'm not judging them. But what I'm trying to say is it was never the idea of God for men to divorce. It was never the idea, right? So when I hear some people say, you know, show me why it's, people should live together, and, and like, okay? He said, this is because men harden their hearts. But if our hearts were soft, okay, forgiveness would take place. And if where forgiveness is, reconciliation would accept. In scripture, of course, there are those conditions, those very clear ones. For example, if somebody says, that for me, I'm not ready to live with you because you're born again, okay? Yeah, you're allowed to separate with them. And that's clear. Jesus gave those exceptions and says, look, if somebody says, I'm not ready to live with you because you're born again, all right? That's their issue, things like that, because they've said for them by force. And God says, but if they are able to deal, if they are able to tolerate your salvation, he says, you're supposed to wait and pray for them. Because the Bible says your holiness will purify them and in the end you can win them to salvation. I'm talking about those who entered marriage and you were both not born again and then somehow one of you got born again. You know, he says, be patient with your spouse. Pray for them. God will bring them, you know, over. You know, your holiness will sanctify them into believing later as you continue to preach. You have faith. It will work. Okay, those exceptions are there. All right. But some of us have even gone beyond the exceptions of scripture and provided for what God said in Moses was the hardness of the hearts of men, all right? And that hardness it can only take the grace of God. It can only take the grace of God to soften our hearts into keeping these commitments. It's because this is a commitment you make one day, but you're supposed to fulfill for the rest of your life. That can only take the grace of God. That can only take the grace of God. But back to what I was saying, you can't build anything. That's why I said even in the putting away of wives in Scripture, it was because... The hearts were hardened, and Moses provides that place under the law. It could only have been a conversation in the law, because those are the things that the law kills. The letter killeth. The letter killeth. The letter killeth. But the Bible says, but the Spirit giveth life. Constant. Giveth life. Present continuous. Giveth life. 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 And that is why he says in Ephesians chapter 2, if you read in the Amplified, okay, you'll see that God's picture was more than just being a covenant. He wanted to create a certain kind of person. He wanted to create a certain kind of individual. He says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 15, the Amplified says, by abolishing in his own flesh, in his own crucified flesh, the enmity caused by the law and with its decrees and ordinances. The Bible says, which he annulled, he says that he from the two might create in himself one new man. And the Amplified says one quality of humanity out of the two, so making peace. The place of reconciliation between you and God was not simply to take away your sins and put you under a new covenant, but he wanted to create a certain quality of human being, a certain quality of humanity. So for those of you who have understood this newness of life, you have a certain quality on your life. You have a certain quality in your humanity that is different from the normal average believer who does not submit himself to the grace of God, who is simply under the law. Although he is or has, if they're born again, is still higher than men, the men of this world, all right? But God gives you a higher understanding and a higher quality of living life and doing life than the average man, Christian, who is under the law, okay, although that one is hundreds of miles away from the person that I know God and consequently way higher than the men of this world. So you're like, in the third level, men of this world, lower level, men which are born again but are under the law, thousands of miles ahead, in fact, different from the men of the earth, but still in a lower 
realm and dimensional function than the man which has obtained the full understanding of the grace of God. That one is elevated. In fact, we can never have a conversation of the higher calling in Christ when we have not discussed this doctrine. Some people think the higher calling is simply of giving of the self. All right? But Paul even spoke of busy bodies. There are people who are serving God, but not in the newness of the spirit, but in the oldness of the letter. All right? And because of that, their labors are not received because they are in their own strengths and abilities and not in the abilities and strength with which God gives. That's why many things around our lives fail, because they have your own effort and application. When they have your own effort and application, you'll fail. Why is this growing so fast? It's the grace of God. Why is this successful? It's the grace of God. Why is her marriage a success? It's the grace of God. Why are the children a success? It's the grace of God. Why is your business top notch? It's the grace of God. Why is your career thriving every time? It's the grace of God. Why are you prospering even in COVID season? It's the grace of God. Okay? There are people who are living under the grace, the mighty hand of God, and you see that God's effort and power is working through everything they're doing. It's deception to say that you're a man who has understood this message and you're still living a life as of a man which is under the law. So what is killing what is supposed to be given life? It was one thing for you to understand the message in your mind, but it's another to conceive it in your spirit. It's a revelation. It's out of that abundance that then scripture opens up for you and everything you read sort of connects you to this newness. If I'm reading the Bible, I can only read it in that realm, in that understanding, because I've been elevated. My awakening is clear and I've been, you know, illuminated by the Spirit to understand this. It's a message that even though some preach it, they don't understand it. Even though some are accurate in the teaching of it, they're simply vessels without the full understanding of the nature that they possess. The nature they possess. Remember, this is key in the fiber of that nature. Because if we don't have the definition of that nature, we're only speaking things that are not us. We're not connected and far from. And in Romans chapter 7, verse 6, again, if you read in the Amplified, he says, but now, now, 2020, if you listen to this sermon, 20 years later or 100 years later, it will be the now still. He says, but now we are discharged from the law and have terminated all intercourse with it, the Bible says, having died to what once restrained and held us captive. It held you captive. Why? Because it has no power to give you life. All right? And verse 7, it says, so now, again he has repeated it, now we serve not under obedience to the old code of written regulations, but under obedience to the promptings of the Spirit in newness of life in newness of life that is how we serve that is how we live let me give a simple example to probably help some of you understand clearly what i'm saying if you are subject to the new covenant the covenant that makes all things new that is ever fixed to renew things its nature the fiber of its nature and character meets everything that's old and makes new seeks to make everything new all right is renewing and renews itself every day. It's restoring and restores itself every day. It has the power of refreshing and refreshing itself. It freshens up itself every day. It's a covenant of freshness. Imagine what that does to your health. That means every morning you're going to wake up new, robust with strength, fortified with an energy that's coming out of you, that's bigger than your age. You feel strong in your bones. You feel healthy in your muscles because the covenant you're under every day releases a dose of newness of your muscles, newness in your sinews, newness in your liver, in your heart, in your arteries, newness in your kidneys, newness in your stomach, newness in your bones, newness in your joints, newness in your vision, your eyes, Newness in your hearing, newness in your head. How can you suffer of disease when there is an ever-fixed law 
that is making you new every day and you understand it? How do you even pray when you know every day you're going to be new? Hallelujah. So what if the doctor said you have this disease? Every day God is going to repair you and repair you and repair you until you jump out of health. There is a lady I know. She was from Rwanda. She sent me a message and she had a very advanced stage of cancer. And he was in her breast and operations and this and that. It was really bad. Doctors did whatever they could. And I'll never forget the day. She used to call me one time. She was in uh, Nairobi. She had sent me a message. Oh, I posted that doing this and that. And I'm going through this chemotherapy and that, that, that. She was saying a lot. It was too much. And I remember the day that woman called me. She said, Apostle, I was listening to a certain someone just right now on my bed. She was listening to one of my someone. She was on the deathbed of cancer all had eaten up her body and she was listening to a certain someone and after that someone she says she started clapping her hands and jubilating and screaming i don't know whether there were people around her or not but she was excited elated and then she gets a call and calls me and when i answer i said hello and the voice behind says apostle i'm the one you've been praying for every day and i said uh -huh, so what's up Oh, Apostle, I'm so healed. And she starts screaming, I am healed. And I asked her, how do you know? I just know that I know that I know that I know that I'm healed. I was listening to the word and something jumped in my spirit. And it tells me that I'm healed and I'm healed. So last month she sends me an email. And guess what? I am cancer free from head to toe. Why? Because she listened to a message that brings newness. Imagine what that message does in your business. Oh, you have loans and debts. I don't care how many loans and debts you have. I don't care how bad your business is doing. Evoke the covenant and say, Ra -ta -ta -ka -pa -ta. For I know the grace of God. I am persuaded that Jesus was a rich man. But for my sake, he became poor. That through his poverty, oh, he owned it. He owned my poverty. I might become rich. And therefore I decree and I declare in the newness of this life of the spirit, which is in me in Christ, my businesses are springing forth. They're sprouting to success. They're going to go upward in multiplication and increase. And I declare and I declare that by the end of this year, things will be so upward and I'll shock those who know me. That's a man who has understood the power of the newness of the spirit. What would that do to a breaking marriage? What would that do to a kid who's on drugs, somebody's son who dropped out of school? What would that do to a man's ministry that is falling in tatters to that pastor who has not paid rent for the building for months because there is lockdown? He has rent for his home. He's looking for fees for his children the moment the lockdown is lifted. What will that do to his ministry? What will it do to the man who has loved God for 20, 30 years but has been under a certain covenant, a law? Yes, they're preaching Christ but not in the fullness of it. And his ministry has been going and going. Members are leaving and leaving. Everything is falling apart. And now they have understood this message. What will happen to their ministry? Upward and upward and upward and upward and upward only only that's the testimony of the gospel so what do you do when you have understood that newness how do you pray in that newness of the spirit you pray in thanksgiving every time i am praying i'm full of thanks my heart is full of gratitude my mind is just blowing with this thanksgiving because every time i open my eyes i see great things in the future I see great days ahead of me. I see great times. I see great years. I see great months. I see my children, both physical and spiritual. I see them successful. I see my parents. I see them old and healthy and strong. I see my businesses. I see they're successful. I see Fanero and it's growing leaps and bounds. It's touching nations. In every nation, there's a fellowship and it's growing by the thousands and the thousands and the hundreds of thousands. I see the media. I see social media. I see the message growing. I see it growing. Why? Because I'm serving in the newness of the spirit. In the newness of the spirit. God just healed somebody of ulcers right now. I see fibroids disappearing right now. Oh, Sabaka Talapa. HIV is living. Now. In the mighty name of Jesus. Now. Yes, now. Barren women are receiving children. Receiving a newness of tubes. I see new uteruses form in people's bodies right now in the name of Jesus. New organs 
I see new hearts. Sharaba katalaba kotelepa. New kidneys. New livers. Sharaba koshetelepa. New lungs. Kotala brozolo poko shakatala pa yereba. New intestines. Koshatala bako brazalando lo sopa. The new stomach, kasanda la bako brezelepa. New joints, kabaka jala broko telepa kara. Si telepa ya. New eardrums, kajala mandolo boza braka talapa koshi. Hasi kabra solepa. New teeth, mako braza katala paka kajile bo. Hasi le brazalapa. That is the power of the newness of the spirit. May your businesses be restored. May your marriages be restored. May your ministries be restored. In the mighty name of Jesus. Some of you, your names were spoiled. People but mouthed you. I feel God revealed your name in the name of Jesus Christ. And will shame your detractors in the mighty name of Jesus. Your ministry is revealed in the name of Jesus. They are said anew. And every time you open your mouth, man of God, fresh manna will come out of you. Every time people will hear you, they will hear a freshness of a message, a distinction of things they have not read or heard anywhere. Your message will be new every day in the mighty name of Jesus. For the worshiper, your worship will be new every day. For the business person, your innovations and creations, your inventions will be new every day in the mighty name of Jesus. As a lady, you have been having a child. That child was diagnosed with autism. God says every morning you're going to see a new boy. Every morning you're going to see a new boy. I know a lady who had a child who was so bad on that spectrum and they even say they will never speak. And that boy is speaking. She just used to bring the boy in church just to listen to the word. That's the newness of the spirit. I declare and I declare that depression is cast. Bipolar is cast. Schizophrenia is cast. In the mighty name of Jesus. Confusion is cast. If you have a sick patient... Speak healing right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And the newness of that message says, yeah, and the man in him, in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed and believed. Say amen. Say amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm excited about what God has done and is doing in your life and what he's going to continue to do in your life. Every other day, you're going to go upward. Every other day, you register better results than you saw yesterday. And you will finish better, strong in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. If you are there and you've never given your life to Christ, what are you waiting for? Now is the acceptable time. God doesn't want you perfect. God doesn't want you everything in order when the lights and cameras are available and everyone, no, 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 you're not doing it for anybody. You're doing it for you. I cannot tell what's going to happen to you next week or next year, but I can tell you what's going to happen to you now. You're going to receive life. You're going to receive a newness. You're going to be translated from darkness to light. And so if you're there, I want you to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you died for me and you shed your blood for me. And now today, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make nonsense.